Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait, wait. What's the problem? This isn't a, This is not a jet show. So what? So how about this? Manning lobs it. Burris alone. Touchdown, New York. Oh, come on. I don't want to hear this. Why not? Super Bowl champions. It doesn't matter. I, I just don't want to hear it. What do you want to hear? How about some Mets? Hey, if I can find one good thing that happened to the Mets, here we go. Oh, Oh, yeah, it's got to be, you know, I'm sorry, we all can't be like the Yankees. Man. Oh, speaking of. This one by Mattingly. Oh, hang on to the roof. Goodbye, home run, Don Mattingly. No. God, I just, I can't believe I just <laughs> All right, well, listen, how about a little Nets? If I have to. Get the jumper to win it. He got it. I can't take it. Anymore. I can't take it anymore. It's been a second. I can't take it. How about some Knicks? Oh, yeah, big spenders. Can't win a playoff. <laughs> Houston pops out up top, down the lane, running jumper, off the front rim, and in! I guess we should talk a little hockey, no? People even watch hockey anymore? They watch the Rangers! Well, if you have the Rangers, you gotta, gotta have some violence. Yeah, no, they didn't have a YouTube in the 80s. So. <laughs> Alright, let's get the show started. Here we are, polar opposites. Hello and welcome to the Polar Opposites podcast. Uh, we are live right now on Strong Island TV on Facebook Live. You can also listen to us on Podbean. That's polaropposites.podbean.com. We're on Spreaker. We're on TuneIn. We're on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at Polar Opposites 1. I'm Matt Stevens. Alongside me, as always, is Craig Moffitt. And Craig... Matty, how you feeling, man? You know, I'd be feeling a lot better if the Giants would just lose games. No, it's not that. Games. Can't do that. But we're not going to start there. We're going to start with the NBA, uh, the MLB. We got a lot to talk to. We're going to do MLB. We're going to do uh, NFL Week 11. Uh, we got a new segment, halftime, which you've listened to, listened to the podcast we rolled out last week, and that which is all off the field stuff. And then we have NBA, and then of course polar bipolar. We're going to start with Major League Baseball because we got some hot stove stuff going on. But first, yes, if you want to call us, talk sports, five one six nine four five nine zero nine nine five one six nine four five nine zero nine nine. We're talking football, basketball, baseball. We got a lot to do and not much time to do it. So, Matty, as we said, yeah, MLB hot stove. Indeed. Well, we got a couple things going on. So, uh, Giancarlo Stanton. Um, they're, they're, Marlins have been in deep conversations with the Giants. You hear the Cardinals made a trade offer. Again, this is going to be a long, drawn-out process because you're talking about a lot of money and a lot of prospects going back. Uh, you have the Mets getting a little pu- getting a little uh, air time today, looking at Ian Kinsler for second base. I would be looking more at uh, at uh, the second baseman of the Marlins, but this, the price might be too steep for the Mets to do that in Kinsler's well, one year. The price is going to be steep for Kinsler in general because he's due $11 million this year, and they're only going to spend about 30 to $45 million. Right. So you're already spending $11 million, which means you're already about a third of what you were planning to spend. Right. So Ian Kinsler, I like Kinsler. Per, I think he's a good hitter. I mean, he wasn't that great last year, like 20 home runs. But it was one of his worst hitting years last year with Detroit. That was also but, a bad team. But I also chalk it up to the fact that Detroit kind of mailed it in in the second yeah, it half. Was bad. It was bad. And I just think they kind of tuned out Brad Osmus at that point. So I'll take Kinsler on a new team. The only thing is it's also on a one-year deal. So it's going to be one of those things where if the Mets want Kinsler, they either eat the salary, put back a, you know, a questionable prospect, or Detroit eats some of that salary and gets a better prospect back from the Mets. The Mets have also been tied to Eduardo Nunez, Neil Walker. But here's my thing with that. We need a guy that can basically play second base for the next three years, maybe four years. I don't want these one-year guys because then you're just right back to where you started again. Well, and that's what Ian Kinsler is. So you would want somebody better than him. There are a couple other guys. You could go after the guy from the Indians. Kipnis. Kipnis. You could go after him. But he's hurt a lot because he plays. He's one of those guys that... You know, it's like these guys that play really hard. Like you really like them yeah. when they're diving all over the place, but when mm-hmm. they're on the on the on the DL for half the year, it doesn't really help. Um, uh, not much else going on. Otani, that that deal is pretty much done at this point. I mean, look, we're he's not gonna make. He's gonna make a lot of money. He could make more money if he comes in two years, but he wants to come now, and then in two years he'll make money again. I think the most signing bonus he can get is like three million dollars. It's not like a that. lot. It's not a lot. But listen, he could be great. He could be a double threat. He could hit and pitch. He could do all sorts of things. And you would think that a team like the Yankees or 
would have more of a, I know that the Yankees in Minnesota, I think, have the most money to spend in this particular area. Yeah. And well, just, actually, no, Texas has the most. I oh, think they right, have like Texas, three and right, a half right, right, to right. four million. The Yankees, now, but the Yankees made a smart move with Jeter yesterday. They traded yes. a prospect for international signing money which only helps them now in most likely landing Shohei Itani because the only other team I think he has a chance at is with the Dodgers. Well, yeah, and, and that's the other thing for me. That's that's what I mean is, is that, like, the Yankees clearly have the, the upper hand here because forget about the money. The money's all equal, right? Like, where are you going to go? I mean, that if you have a choice between going to Texas and going to New York, you're going to go to New I York. I mean, you're probably going to go to New York. I mean, you're going to pay more taxes there, but what the hell does he care? He's going to make so much money, it's not going to matter. Um, Aaron Judge had shoulder surgery, shoulder surgery today, nothing major, just cleaning up some crap. Uh, we still have no idea who the Yankee manager is going to be. They haven't even interviewed everybody yet. So well, you're, you're just I getting mean, a real hodgepodge of former players. Yes. So you're getting Aaron Boone. You're getting Chris Woodward now was the latest oh, one I saw. Oh, yeah. All right, former uh, Met. I don't even uh, know what position he has with a team these days. You have Hensley Bam Bam Mullins. At least he's okay. a bench coach. I'll give him that. He's a bench coach. Yep. yep. They interviewed uh, Rob Thompson. Yes. That was the first interview, but it doesn't look like it took. less least likely to get the job, I would say. And that's it. Yeah. Because this is really one of the best kept secrets in well, because in the, sports. The, the, the only reason it's the best kept secret, best kept secret, is because the Yankees don't know who they want to they want to they want to manage the team. They don't. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something, Brian Cashman. I'll tell you this right now. If you freaking don't bring Jack back, Joe Girardi and freaking Eric Wedge or Chris Tillman or somebody like this gets the job, what well, what's the point? He's not coming back. What's the point? He's not coming back. But no, the no, thing no, is, I'm so, saying though, like it makes no sense. Like, if you're telling me that Joe Girardi was so bad with the players on a personal level that he only got more wins out of e them every season than he, than he should have, if you're telling me that's the only problem, then, then, you're, then it has but to be do, somebody with some name to it. But here's the thing. Because all I keep hearing about nowadays is how you want guys who are good communicators. But doesn't that seem just like a little overrated just to be a good communicator? No, the Yankees because are the having... Thing is, but, the, but here's the thing. Girardi was a very good manager. Oh, for absolutely. That. He was a very good manager. But for he that. didn't hold this, their hand, Craig. He but, didn't help them through the tough and times. And what's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, is but that's what. But that's. Let's be fair. If you're not good with the players, mm -hmm. right? What the hell else job do you have as a manager these days? Yeah. The GM is giving you all the numbers. They're saying do this when he's at 70 pitches. Take it. But there's no decisions being made on the field. But I don't like. I said Girardi I mean, got outside of the one mistake against Cleveland. Right. Okay. In the playoffs. I thought Girardi had a terrific postseason. He had a terrific year, but that's and the thing is, it, but it comes back to okay, him and Cashman to clash, but he he clashes with everybody. He's just right, a different but, but type you're, of. But you know, you're looking at it like you would looking at a manager search 15 years ago. Right. The managers don't do anything. They're not neat. You could honestly, you could manage the team with an iPad. I mean, that's, like, let's be fair. Well, everything nowadays with, you know, metrics and statistics Right, I mean, that's all it is. So, just... so at the end of the day, you're looking for a guy who can communicate with the team, which is why when the Yankees are done, when they, the, the guy's done doing the interviews, they go do a media session and to see how they deal with the media. Right. So, so you got that going now, for you. We talked about Stanton before. Yes. There was a rumored trade on the table yes. with the San Francisco Giants where the Giants would get Stanton and D. Gordon. Okay. And in return, the Marlins would get Joe Panic and four prospects. Marlins don't have to eat the salary for Stanton or Gordon. Doesn't look like. At least maybe not, maybe definitely not Gordon, but maybe Stanton. Are you making that move? I mean, you don't have a choice, right? I mean, the Giants were bad. On, but it depends on what the... The Giants were bad last year. Right, but, but they're not going to be bad this year. I mean, if they get D. Gordon and Mike Stanton with, with a healthy Madison Bumgarner and... The, you still got Johnny Cueto on that team. You still have Jeff Samarge on that team. And I know Jeff Samarge is not great, but he's he can give you some innings. I mean, they still have some guys on that team. You still have Buster Posey. I mean, like, if you had those two guys, you are adding a fourth and an, and a, and a leadoff hitter to that team. And p batting Buster Posey third with Stanton batting behind him or Buster Posey second with Stanton batting behind him or however you want to do it is, is insane. So I think if you're the Giants and you, like, if you're the Giants and you're like, you know what? We have Bumgarner and we have Posey for like a couple more years. Right. Let's go see if we can win two more. Yeah. Right? Like, let's do it. And then if at the end it's just, it's just we're just sitting here just making money off Stanton, trying to make home run records, well, then that's what we do. We did it with Barry Bonds once. We'll do it again. Well, you probably won't hear more about the hot stove. Or the GM meetings or the winter meetings are right around the yes. corner. I think they're yes. a few weeks away, right around the time of our next show on uh, Strong Island TV. But then you'll start seeing trades going down. You'll see... Um, 
you know, yeah. signings, you know, maybe not a huge, like a ton of signings, but you'll probably see some of the guys start coming off the board at that point. So we'll have more later on. But right now, these are pretty interesting developments. I mean, Stanton possibly getting traded, which now is looking more like a reality oh, no, than it it's, did it's happening. a few there's, months ago because of no the contract. And now on top of that, Otani getting posted and then eventually... And then any other move, you know, the Mets possibly making moves. The Yankees probably make some moves as well. And once Otani signs, it'll be like a, it'll be like a dominoes fall. It'll be kind of crazy. So real quick, uh, and then we're going to get to a little uh, NFL, and then we got halftime. I'm just going to run through the list because the MLB, the uh, Hall of Fame inductees came out, the people who are, are eligible to be inducted. We're just going to go through the list really. There's 33 names. I'm going to give them to you fast. Craig's going to say yes or no, and we'll go from there. Trevor Hoffman. Yes. Vladimir Guerrero. Yes. Edgar Martinez. Yes. Roger Clemens. No. Barry Bonds. Oh, man, this is such Just a Just say yes or no. <laughs> no. The answer is yes. No. no. Mike Messina. Yes. Kurt Schilling. Yes. Manny Ramirez. Yes. Larry Walker. Just say no. <laughs> no. I guess. Fred McGriff. No. Jeff Kent. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say yes. Okay. Gary Sheffield. No. Billy Wagner. No. Sammy Sosa. No. Chipper Jones. Yes. Jim Jim uh, Jim Tomei. No. Scott Rowland. No. Jim Tomei, six hundred home runs. You're just you're just deciding that that is null and void at this point. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not. I'm not saying that to be a jerk. I'm saying that no, like no. that used to be a thing. Like five hundred, six hundred home runs. You're in. Like, are we saying that the home run is so cheap at this point that Jim Tomei's only job was to hit home runs, so he hit six hundred of them, and it's not that big a deal because he couldn't do anything else? Because if you're yeah. saying that, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, he didn't really do a lot, right? I mean, right, that's he, he wasn't the greatest decent, hitter in the world. He, he was, was a an okay first, first baseman. baseman. All right, so, okay, cool. Scott Rowland? No. Andrew Jones? No. Johan Santana? Yes. Really? Johnny Damon? That's my bias as a Met. Yeah, you think? <laughs> uh, Johnny Damon? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say yes. Really? Yeah. Carlos Zambrano. This is the Hall of Fame we're talking Car- about, right? Yeah, I know. Not this the Hall my, of people my, who are like okay my, players, but maybe had some good years. Jamie Moyer? No. Just because uh, Omar, 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 Omar Vizquel. 47? Omar Vizquel. No. Chris Carpenter. No. Levon Hernandez. No. Orlando Hernandez. Orlando Hudson. No. Kevin Millwood. Oh, for the love of no. Kerry Wood. Oh, for crying out loud. Is, is this Ca- the injured Hall of Fame? Carlos Lee. Oh, stop. Stop. Aubrey, Aubrey Huff. No. Hideki Matsui. Listen, if Aaron Seeley can't get into the Hall of Fame. Hideki Matsui. Yes, I would put Godzilla. Really? Yes. Uh, Isringhausen and Brad Lidge. Lidge, no. You can't put, if you say Isringhausen, no. No, I would say Isringhausen, no. No, No, of course not. Insane. Okay, so we did that. Uh, Always fun to do because here's the thing about the Hall of Fame. When you say the name, it immediately comes to your head, yes or no. You've watched this person play, assuming you've watched this person play. The thing is, I'm not big on, yes or no. I'm not the biggest, like, past stats guy. I mean, I don't remember them that well. I mean, I remember them playing, but I can't say for certain. But like, you remember. Brad Lidge was a decent closer, but he's not yeah. a Hall of Fame closer. No, of course not. Hoffman, of course not. definitely. And I'll say this. If Chipper Jones gets in before Vlad gets in, because Vlad was on last year and didn't get in, if Chipper Jones get in, gets in before Vlad gets in, that's insane. Uh, NFL Week 11, um, Giants win in an ugly, ugly, <laughs> ugly, 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 ugly game. Well, first of all, like... Brutally ugly game. That was as... That is why I'm not sold on the chefs. Oh, you can't be. I can't. I try, and like, I, the thing was, I, I read all. I read a lot of stuff about. Everybody loves the Chiefs. Everybody loves Andy Reid. They started out five and zero, oh, but they've been bad. And we always said this about them, right? Like, but they it's, just weren't sold on their offense. But it's the thing for me is is that you're not sold on the offense, even though you should be, and you're not sold on the fact that if he, they have to play in elements, like even at home, like their home field isn't the Superdome. So like if they have to play a, a playoff game at home and it's snowing or it's windy or it's raining, Alex Smith can't throw the ball through that. Mm-hmm. He just can't. Yeah. And so what do you get? You get what you got on Sunday. They scored nine points against the one in eight Giants. The Giants. Yeah, that was, I a mean, brutal the thing was, loss for them. Just brutal. It's just one of those situations that, you know, what bothers me about the Giants in general was for the past two weeks, you could really tell they'd mailed it in. Yeah. And you could see it. I mean, you could see Jenkins and Janoris Jenkins. And then on top of that, Janoris, Janoris Jenkins had a crappy attitude after the game. I was being called out for his lack of hustle and everything. And oh, all yeah, that I stuff. played hard. And like, I mean, he literally gets burned and he literally uh. looks like he pulls up like he's like almost like the equivalent of trying to cover the spread on a bet so you, the guy just pulls up for right. the sole purpose of just being like yeah i don't want them to win by 14 points so right. i'm you know i'm just gonna whatever 
And then they come out in this game, and it's a home game and everything, and then they play their hearts out all of a sudden. So now I'm confused. Right. Is it McAdoo or is it the players now? Because I don't know. Um, I, I would no say idea. that it's both, um, and and that's okay. I mean, like it's it's fine. I, I honestly I don't care because the, they they shouldn't be back. There's literally nothing McAdoo can or should be able to do that keep his job at the end of the year. Now, what scares me is that if they go six and ten, or they go seven and nine, it's or like God a forbid it's, eight and eight, then they're going to keep him. And like, what happens now? Next well, year no. they might go eleven now. and six and five again, but who knows? I mean, now here's the thing. No, I was reading today on my way home from the job that actually pays me, Yes, that he's been given the dreaded vote of confidence Oh, you love year. the vote of confidence. The vote of confidence is my favorite thing. But at the end of the day, though, they play the Redskins on Thanksgiving. They still have some tough games left to go to. They still play Dallas. They still play Philly. You know, they have a lot of tough games left to go before the season's out. Give me a record that you think McAdoo saves his job for next year. Eight and eight. Not even four and twelve or like anything like that. No, why? Because it's no. really tough to gauge. Like, listen, I'm not saying McAdoo has done. It's not, not McAdoo's fault. McAdoo has been a pretty bad coach this year in general. And when the players shut down on him, that's when it's like a huge red flag on top of that. But then when you see a game like this, and then you're reading the articles after the game, where it's like, well, Eli gave us a great pep talk, and you know everybody was loose in the <laughs> locker room and everything. I, I can't make heads or tails of what's going on with that team. Nobody can, and that, but that, but that's the way it is. So, so enough on the Giants. They play Thursday night in what is now just an abysmal Thursday night Thanksgiving Day game. Um, what you had go on this weekend was, uh, we'll talk about the Bills a little bit later. Um, you had uh, a missed kick last night for a tie game. Oh, Blair Walsh. Blair Walsh just shank. No no big deal. Shank a pot. It was short, but I couldn't tell if someone tipped it. No, I, even still, it doesn't matter. you got to make that kick. Um, just here's the thing you see throughout the NFL right now is there are some really, really good teams, like four or five maybe really good teams. There's a ton of terrible teams, and there's a couple teams in the middle that like have young players, and they might be up and coming, but they're still pretty beatable. The problem is that the majority of the NFL right now is just bad. It's just bad football. It's bad to watch. I mean, it's bad. Those games, there were three games on. The third, the 4 o'clock games <laughs> on Sunday were <laughs> brutal football games. I'll put it this way. I left that game at 7-7, Chargers-Bills. Yeah. I went to my in-law's house for dinner. And when I turned it on, maybe like an hour later, it right. was thirty-seven to seven Chargers. I was like, "What it's the insane. hell happened?" And that's the thing: the Chargers aren't that good. They're just not that good. Not. The other thing I want to say real quick is I want to talk about the Eagles, and then we're going to do halftime because I got to. I, I, people and listen, I get it. The Eagles are what are they nine and one? Like I get it. They're playing really well right now, and you can't take away from it. And I'm not saying they're a bad team. I'm not saying no. They're, I'm not saying they're a terrible team. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that they're a very good team, but I think we are overrating them just a tad. Okay, let's see. And listen, they, I still think if Zeke plays that game Sunday, the outcome might be a little different. I, I mean. It's probably the, a loss, but it's definitely not as bad a loss. So real quick, we had a win at the Redskins, a loss at the Chiefs, a win at the Giants, a win at the Chargers, a win at the Cardinals, okay. a win at the Panthers, okay. a win at the Redskins, a win at the Niners, and a win at the Broncos, <laughs> and a win at the Cowboys. The only game that is remotely impressive in there is the Panthers. Because, yes, the, although the Bronco game at the beginning of the year was an impressive game, it's not after the Giants beat them. Now, who run down the rest of their skin? You run down the rest then of their skin go, real quick? Then uh, they go, now they're home Bears, That's at win. Seahawks, That's at a loss. Rams. That's a loss. At Giants. That's a win. Home Raiders, home Cowboys. I'll give them Raiders win. Cowboys Zeke might be back. That and they're going to be the outcome. Seahawks. The Seahawks aren't good. They have no defense. They have no defense. Um, in there. You know, I am a firm believer that East Coast teams don't necessarily play well on the West Coast. They I don't, really... but I think that defense is so banged up right now. You're going to have no Cam in that game. You're going to have no, the, Leg the the entire Legion of Boom is gone. Bloom. Boom, <laughs> sir. Boom. Boom goes down. Well, Chancellor's out. Sherman's out. Thomas has been hurt on right. and off. So without that, I mean, like, the, the, the Eagles are a good football team. I'm not saying they're not a good football team. But keep, people keep trying to tell me that they're the best football team, and I don't believe that. Because until somebody beats the New England Patriots, they are the best team in football. It's just not – that's it. That's it. The thing about the Seahawks is, again, and the one thing you saw it in the game on Sunday – on Monday, I'm sorry, yesterday, no running game. They no. still don't have a running well, they don't game. Have an They've line. gone through so many running backs, though, between Thomas Rawls, Christine Michael, Eddie Lacy, even C.J. Prosize. 
it just goes on and on, right? It does, I mean, but... like, and they and it just can never get it going. And their receivers are okay. I mean, Russell Wilson's a great quarterback. You got to give him Russell yeah, Wilson. He is. And their defense is still pretty good. I mean, but losing half of the secondary is definitely a tough blow. But again, at the end of the day, I mean, looking at that schedule, I don't like some of those road games for the Eagles. And you could definitely bet that the Cowboys are going to give them a game if it's Week 17, even if it is in Philly. Right. But by then, you never know because Philly may have nothing to play for by then. Because they may have already clinched the East, so they may just rest everybody, right. especially Carson Wentz. Right. Call us if you want to talk sports, 516-945-9099. Again, 516-945-9099. Check us out at polaropposites.podbean.com, iTunes, Spreaker.com, and tune in radio. And follow us on Twitter at Polar Opposites one Maddie, it is time for halftime. I'm so glad you that. <laughs> this is the halfway point of the show. We have four, four topics. This is more like an off the grid. This is probably stuff that most likely no one's really talking about. Maddie, are you ready? I am indeed ready. Let's do it. Okay, here we go. Number one for you. GQ Magazine has officially named Colin Kaepernick as their man of the year in their latest issue. However, many people are ripping the magazine for their choice, including former ESPN reporter Britt McHenry who in a series of tweets said, quote, wear socks depicting police officers as pigs, wear Fidel Castro as a fashion statement at Miami, sue NFL for collusion when GF compares owners to slave owners, win Citizen of the Year, serve in the U.S. military, nothing. What a joke, GQ. McHenry believes if any football player should have won the award, it should have been J.J. Watt, who raised $37 million for the city of Houston after Hurricane Harvey. Maddie, in your opinion, does GQ really believe Kaepernick is Citizen of the Year, or is this a PR stunt to sell magazines? Well, I'm sure it can it be both. Sure. I mean, it can be both, right? So, so why can't it be both? And also, let me say something, Britt McHenry, if that is your real name, which it probably isn't, okay, is that you can be two things. You can make mistakes when you are trying something new, when you are doing something different. You can have missteps and still not have what you're trying to say be polluted by those missteps, okay? You're telling me that everything you've ever said, Don Warren, has been good and never offended anybody? So just relax on the socks and the other and, and the Fidel Castro thing. But also go listen to what he said about Fidel Castro. Actually read what he said about Fidel Castro. And maybe you'll get some insight into what he was trying to say. Okay, because he wasn't necessarily defending Fidel Castro. He was just drawing a parallel to certain things. So maybe read and do that. But as far as GQ goes, Yes, it's a, it's a stunt, but that doesn't mean he can't be. He's drawn more focus to the problem of the way black people are treated by police in this country than any other person, and that includes the people who have been killed by cops. So no, I think it's fine. All right. And I'm totally down with it. <laughs> uh, number two, Oscar De La Hoya has reportedly called out Conor McGregor for a comeback fight after being retired for nearly 10 years. According to De La Hoya, he's been secretly training and is confident he can take out McGregor in two rounds. Oscar's last fight was back in 2008, and was boring as hell, when he was beaten badly by <laughs> knockout against Manny Pacquiao. What's pretty ironic about this announcement is De La Hoya ripped Floyd Mayweather for fighting Conor McGregor this past August because he felt it would have a negative impact on the Triple G Canelo Alvarez fight he was promoting a few weeks later. Craig, is De La Hoya a hypocrite for calling out McGregor? Absolutely he is. And here's the funny thing though, why is everybody calling out Conor McGregor, a guy who doesn't box? I mean, if you're coming out of retirement, now listen, May, McGregor, McGregor kind of got the, started it with Mayweather's and that, then it just kind of built up to probably one of the most ridiculous boxing matches in history. But the fact of the matter is, is that now De La Hoya, who lambasted Mayweather for fighting McGregor, now wants to fight McGregor. So is it because you think McGregor is an easy out? Or is it because you think that, I, like, I, I mean, why not fight? So, yeah, it's money and I the understand that part. Man said it best. <laughs> Money, 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 money. <laughs> I understand that part, but I'm saying like maybe boxing's changed. A lot of the fighters are young now. De La Hoya can never hang with any of those guys in a million years. So in that sense, but I mean, just to call out Conor McGregor just makes you look more ridiculous because you lambasted the fight to begin with with McGregor. And now all of a sudden you want to fight the guy because now you're saying, well, 
Mayweather took eight rounds, now I could beat him in two. It just, it makes no yeah, sense Yeah, but Craig, we live in a society where everything you once said doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter. And it's, you're right. <laughs> you're right to, an, you know, you're definitely right. But it's just the fact of like, this is exactly why nobody still takes boxing seriously. There's a couple of good fights here and there, but then you get stuff like this, and people kind of just eat it up because it's Conor McGregor. And Conor McGregor is going to want to do this fight because he doesn't mind pocketing another $100 because that's really unfortunate state of what boxing and boxers are going to do these days. Indeed. Number three, Maddie, if you wanted to have a bath or shower and come out of it smelling like Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC Japan has the product for you. They've announced a partnership with Japanese retailer Village Vanguard to produce KFC-scented bath bombs. They will come in the shape of a drumstick and crafted with, quote, 11 secret herbs and spices that will allow you to soak in the goodness that is the Colonel's secret recipe. They will be available for a limited time only, and the 100 lucky people who get to not only receive the soap, they also receive a box and coupon for a secret combination pack of chicken. A few months back, KFC offered chicken-inspired nail polish, as well as chicken-flavored chocolate truffles. Maddie, if Colonel Sanders were alive today, would he approve of people using a secret Western recipe to wash themselves? I think if, as a, I think if as a person, <laughs> and you're Colonel Sanders, yeah. I think that any way that you're selling KFC, you're happy selling KFC. Now, to me, this kind of makes me want to throw up a little bit because why not just. Pour like, a bowl, pour a vat of gravy yeah, on Yeah, like, it's greasy and gross and disgusting, and that's fine. But the bigger problem is this. If you wear that fragrance, expect potheads to come up to you and ask you where your chicken is. Because that's what's going to happen. We're in a day of, we're in an age of cannibalism or something, because well, you have KFC you, making nail polish. Well, but think about this. Could you imagine the zombie apocalypse? You better not wear that during the zombie oh, apocalypse, no, you're, you're man. Done. You're going to be screwed. You are absolutely You're going to be done. totally screwed, because all the zombies are going to be following you, because you get to smell like KFC. It's going to be terrible. Number four. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, Danica Patrick's career as a full-time NASCAR driver ended in a major letdown as she finished 37th at the Ford EcoBoost 400 after crashing into the wall due to a blown tire. Patrick plans to race the Indianapolis 500 and the Daytona 500 in 2018. Patrick ranked 28th in the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series this year. Jesus, that's a long name. With her best finish being 24th back in 2015 and 2016. Her best finish was during the Xfinity Cup Series when she finished 10th overall back in 2012. Craig, at the end of the day, was Danica Patrick a waste of time in NASCAR? I don't think she was a waste of time. I mean, listen, she was a woman who broke into a man's sport. I mean, and the thing is, NASCAR wasn't that sport that was insanely popular to the point where it wasn't like not popular where you needed a woman to kind of make it popular. I mean, NASCAR is insanely popular all over the country. It's just that once she got into NASA, NASCAR and just, I mean, they're all just better drivers in general, you know, Earnhardt and, you know, the list goes on and on, Gordon and all them. It just, she just kind of got lost in the shuffle and just kind of disappeared, right? I mean, she really only started, she really only became more visible when it was doing the GoDaddy commercials or anything like that. But most yeah. of her finishes were just either didn't finish or she was really towards the bottom of the pack. I think the highest finish in one race was 10th. I don't even think she finished at the top five or whatever. I mean, she won some polls, you know, for qualifying times and stuff like that. Right. But overall, I mean, her NASCAR career could be looked at as a bit of a failure just because, you know, she's going from Indy cars to, you know, kind of the big boys. So at that sense, listen, I respect everything she did for NASCAR for what she did to get there. But at the end of the day, it almost seems like, well, this is a great, you know, it's a farewell. It's almost the way she went out is kind of like, well, I mean, what I would say is, uh, is simply put that her career as a professional driver, take gender out of it, was subpar, but the fact that she did it was extraordinary, right? Because she was the first woman to ever do that full time. I mean, I think she's the only woman to do it in general. Right. I don't think so, there's another so female race car So that right there makes driver. you go down in the annals of history as a groundbreaker, so to speak. Now, you would have liked the career to be a little better, at least one win in there. And she doesn't have that, but it doesn't change the fact of what she did, opening the door to other female drivers who may want to pursue that career going forward. All right, halftime is officially over, and on, it I is gotta, time. I gotta fade down the running man. Oh, uh, yeah. One of the greatest theme songs of all time for, fantastic. A, for a fake game show. Oh, fantastic. Again, we are the Polar Opposites. 
Call us 516-945-9099 if you want to talk sports. We're talking football. We talk baseball, basketball. we got about 10 minutes till Polar Bipolar finishes up our show. Indeed. Uh, but let's segue to the NBA real quick. Yes. Uh, the Knicks with a big win last night, won yes. by over 20 to the yes. Clippers. Yes. Um, didn't need, necessarily need Kristaps Porzingis in that game. Solid no. games all around from Hardaway Jr., who was playing injured. McDermott had a big game off the bench. He's actually turning into a bit of a steal for the Knicks in that trade. Well, that trade now is actually, I mean, if you think about it, you got Venus Cantor, who's been in your starting center the whole season. He's averaged a double-double over the season. Um, he's been excellent on the offensive boards, and he's allowed Porzingis to not have to take all those bumps and hits and be underneath the basket the entire time, getting beat up and getting those stupid fouls. So between him and O'Quinn, they've been covering that space. Yep. And Doug McDermott has been excellent. And the one thing you heard about McDermott, the one thing you hear about everybody, right, when they get traded to you, is nobody ever talks about anybody's offense anymore. It's all about their defense, right? And all you heard was McDermott was bad defensively. And he might have been, but he's, he's been a terrific an excellent three shooter. He's a terrific three, but yeah, we four, knew that, right? Yeah, we, five threes last night? Yeah, but we knew that out of college. We knew that about him, but we didn't know about his defense. And he's been, if nothing else, he's been tenacious on defense, which I know is cliched. And that's how, where I live in, in sports, yeah. is the cliche land. But um, he's been very good, surprisingly good, and fun to watch. The whole team's just been fun to watch. And, and, and as, as I'm watching this game last night, Craig, I, I came to the realization that the Knicks are at a point now where they've reached that middle tier of teams, right? Mm -hmm. Where, like, 50% of the league they should beat, right? right? Let's be fair. There are, sure. if you look at the, 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 the teams in the NBA right now, 50% of the league the Knicks should beat. There's about a 20% window the Knicks are in where it's give or take any night could be win or lose, win or lose. Yeah. And then another, say, you know, what, 20% of teams that they just should lose to. Golden State, Toronto, sure. Cleveland, Houston, those teams. So the Knicks are in a really good spot right now. They, they you know, they... Luckily, they've been pretty good on the injury front. I mean, they've had some knocks here and there. Uh, um, uh, Hardaway Jr.'s got a foot thing, but he played last night. Not nearly as bad as the as the poor Nets with everybody thing that's going on, and now Dinwiddie's the star. But we'll get to them in a second. Yeah. But the thing you like about the Knicks right now is they're beating the teams they should beat, and they won that game easily enough last night to where Porzingis played under 30 minutes, and Hardaway Jr. got to only play 25 minutes. Yeah. And and also uh, Nilakina was bad, so you know, so he gets benched. They put in sessions. He's okay. They move forward, and there you go. They're beating teams they should beat, and that's you know, all you can ask for from the Knicks. It's tough to really gauge the Clippers because they gave that huge contract to Blake Griffin, which will ultimately oh, they're kind a bad of regret. Team, but they, but they were, and then they didn't have Chris Paul, and I know they have the guy from uh, Tia Dozic, whatever his name yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. And Danilo but, Gallinari, who's hurt again, shockingly enough. But the thing about the hey Knicks, guys, right? Danilo Gallinari's hurt again. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the thing about the Knicks is, is that they're playing a little more loose. It's not really, you know, obviously without the triangle now with with Phil well, and all an that, NBA they're offense. playing they're playing an NBA offense. Hornacek is more comfortable coaching the team now because I, I really thought that having the triangle. I mean, you can agree. I mean, you were the bigger. You're obviously the big Knicks fan. The fact is, is when he was coaching the triangle, it was definitely frustrating not only the players, but I think it was frustrating the coaches. And a guy like Hornacek is not going to come out and say, well, I don't want to run the triangle, but I have no choice. Right. He's going to say what, you know, his boss wants to hear. But now once Phil is gone and pretty much they have a new GM who, you know, has done a pretty good job so far. You know, I'm not going to say Hardaway's worth the $71 million yet, but I like what I see out of him right now. And the Enos Cantor trade, I think, is outstanding. I mean, oh. from both teams' perspectives, because, you know, Mello in Oak in, with the Thunder is going to be great. But getting Cantor and McDermott, and those guys have been huge contributors to start. The only thing at this point you just regret about that deal is you didn't get the first round pick. You just wish you got. You would well, probably wish you got the first round draft. But pick. apparently the pick is uh, it's not Oklahoma City's. It's Chicago's okay. second round pick. So that could be like the first pick okay. of the second round. And if that's true, then it's actually a decent pick going forward. Real quick, so the Knicks have Wednesday. They're home against Toronto. Then at Atlanta, at Houston, home Portland, home Miami. So listen, I mean, you know, you should be able to beat Atlanta on the road. I know Atlanta's an okay team, but you should be able to beat Atlanta on the road. You should be able to beat a team like Atlanta. Houston, at Houston, you're not winning that game, right? Like, their games are just not going to win, and you just got to give that up. No, I mean, fine. even a game like when they played Toronto yeah, uh, like, last week, I, that was a tough game to play because and, Toronto's a pretty good team. And I mean. all I want to see from them tomorrow when they play Toronto is just be better than last time. You don't have to win the game, but just make it closer. Make it a game in the fourth quarter. Don't make it a blowout in the entire game. Now onto the Nets real quick, or just, I mean, it, it's it's amazing what is happening. Do you remember <laughs> in your sports life having this many teams just decimated by injuries in one season? 
the yeah. Mets, the the Nets. They're all my teams, dude. They are all. Uh, the they're, Jets they're aren't all, decimated by injuries. Not yet. I'm I waiting. mean, not yet. That's I true. mean, we're we're still on the countdown to McCown injury watch right now. So well, the way he dives all over the place, yeah. it's coming soon. I mean, look, <laughs> the thing about the Nets is. The sad, the crazy thing is, I'll take six and ten right now. Of course, no, absolutely. Because I think they've played better than anticipated, especially when they lost Lynn at the first game of the season. And then on top of that, you lose D'Angelo Russell, Which and you don't sucks. know how long you're going to be out because D'Angelo Russell's been terrific for yeah, them since yeah, they got he's him. Really good. But here's what I like: where the team is headed. The fact is, is that they're getting production out of guys who wouldn't be on other teams right now. Am right, I, right, right. For example, Spencer Dinwiddie, a guy they picked off off the G League last year. From He was with the Pistons for a little while. He didn't really make too much noise with the Pistons. Went to the D League before it became the G League. Because <laughs> it's Gatorade now? Yeah. Is that why it's the G League? I don't know why they call okay. it the G League. I couldn't tell you that. Um, Are we just next year it's going to be the But the thing is, he's getting, he's getting a ton of minutes now, and he's making the most of it. He's had, you know, double-doubles. He's had, he had over 20 points the other night before against Golden State. You're seeing what Kenny Atkinson's trying to do, and that's develop these guys. And that's exactly what the whole plan is, yeah. right? I mean, after this, after the 2018 draft, the Nets get their draft picks back, and they'll have control of those draft picks. But for now, this is the best we have to do. Yeah. Alan Crabb has been terrific, I think. I mean, yeah. he's had a couple yeah. of rough games, but his three-point shooting is exactly why they got him. And he's been very good from three-point. He was 6 of 11 on Sunday. You're seeing the the rookie Jared Allen play well. He had a big he had a big block. I I, th- I can't remember who on who it was. It might have been on like Harris, uh, not Harrison Barnes, um, Draymond Green. Um, Even better. <laughs> but you're just <laughs> seeing the development of some of these guys. Damari Carroll's been a pretty good pickup for them. You know, Joe Harris is good off the bench. He's a little bit of a spark plug. The thing that I worry about with the Nets is is that they come out really flat. And I don't know if it's a case of they're just intimidated by these teams to start. Right. Because, listen, they're one of the worst teams in the league, whether you want to believe it or not. Maybe not the worst right now because the Hawks are pretty bad, the Bulls are pretty bad, the Suns aren't very good. I mean, but teams like the Nets who are young, still a bit inexperienced, have a few veterans, but most of the other guys are still a bit raw. Maybe they just come out of the gate very intimidated by teams like Golden State. They got to play the Cavaliers tomorrow on the road. Right, right. I mean, I don't know how that game's going to go. Boston, they're they play. Gonna lose. You know, I mean, like, but the thing is, they've been in these games well. The problem is that the first half they're just disastrous. Well, but, but last year was with, with, they were a terrible third quarter team. This year they're just horrible in the first half. Right, but that's the thing. So against a team like the Warriors, against a team like the Cavaliers, like they can keep up with them for a little while. But sooner or later, talent wins out. Yeah, it just does. I mean, you and said so if it, you don't have enough talent, you're not going to win. When we did the show, we did our podcast last week. We were talking about the Knicks when they lost to the Cavs, yeah. and the Knicks kind of hung with the Cavs. And in the fourth quarter, LeBron just took over, and that was it. The Knicks had no answer because yeah. it's LeBron James. Yeah. It's the same thing in a way with the Nets because the Nets played well. Steph Curry was killing them. Then he fouls out. And then Klay Thompson comes in and just buries them. Yeah. And then that's pretty you much how win. it ends. So it goes back to the whole talent discussion. He's, he's 100% right. The Nets will eventually get there. But right now, I like what I'm seeing. At 6-10, and 10, I think they are a good team. Are they going to contend for a playoff spot? Maybe. The East is so weak right now. I could easily see the Nets going on a run and sneaking into the eighth spot. You could get the eighth spot with yeah. 37 I mean, listen, wins at this point. I mean, 38 wins. At the end of the day, yeah, I would say so. And at the end of the day, all it's going to get you is your reward is going to be getting creamed by Boston or Cleveland in the first round. But at least he got there, right? <laughs> Indeed. Now, real quick on the rest of the NBA, we got about three minutes until we get to polar bipolar. Um, the Cavaliers have won, I think it's like six straight in a row. So they're starting to find their groove. Boston's won um, 16 Boston's in a row. Boston's won 16 in a row. I mean, look, there's a reason why Kyrie wanted to go to Boston. And one of the reasons is the coach. And there's a reason why Boston over the last couple of years, even without the presence of a true great, great player, has been one of the top six teams in the NBA, yep. and that's Brad Stevens. You, If you listen to the podcast long enough, I wanted Brad Stevens when he became available years ago, even when the Knicks weren't great, because Brad Stevens is a great coach. He's a smart guy. He gets the most out of his players because his players are just in the right spot. They're just in the right spot. But Brad Stevens was that coach. Remember, Boston was bad when they hired Brad Stevens, yeah. and they just basically said, it's kind of similar to like your boy Kyle Shanahan, with the Niners. Yeah, just you gave him the job, it. give him a few years to develop the team. They gave Brad Stevens as much time as they possibly could, and now they're seeing the reward from it. And he's a very good coach. He's a great coach. And the thing is, is that, you know, Boston's added a few players here and there. You know, obviously with when they had Jay Crowder, and now recently obviously with Kyrie Irving and Al Horford, and even get you know, lo, you know, getting the draft picks from the Nets where they got Jalen Brown, they got Jason Tatum, and all those guys. 
you're seeing the reward. So Boston's in a really, really good spot right now to pretty much, for a while, they're going to be a good, you know, step. I mean, they're going to be, the, I think, eventually the number one seed because, I don't know, part of me thinks this is the last year for the Cavs to just keep it all together because whether well, because LeBron leaving. Yeah, like he, if he goes to L.A., which looks more and more likely, if he goes to – and all that stuff. He's but going it, somewhere that's not Cleveland, guys. It's, 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 not even, it's not even really a question at this point. Real quickly before the polar bipolar, yeah. are you surprised in the least – surprised that LeVar Ball wasn't grateful to Trump or whatever, wasn't grateful in general for getting the help to get the kids out of China? That's like saying, Matt, were you surprised when you look in the mirror and you didn't have any hair on the top of your head? Like, no, I'm not surprised because it didn't just grow back overnight. <laughs> he didn't just become a decent person overnight. LeVar, LeVar Ball is a clown. And so he acted a clown way. The only good part about this whole thing is Donald Trump knows what it's like to be treated by Donald Trump now. That's, the, that's what we get out of this, is that LeVar Ball successfully treated Donald Trump the same way Donald Trump treats others. Now, and that's the only fun part. Here's the one thing I will say about Lonzo Ball, is that for a guy who's had to put up with this, then his younger brother getting arrested in China for shoplifting, I got to admit, he's definitely been kind of keeping a low profile. Yeah, I mean, well, he's not he really, he's not been great. So. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't <laughs> been very good for the Lakers. I mean, they haven't been a very good team in general. But just the fact that he's... It really hasn't been too much of a distraction for him. Right. And he's actually, you know, listen, he's a rookie. He's going through the growing pains. He had the triple-double, the other, you know, a few weeks ago. And now he's kind of hit a, hit a rough spot. He's at a rough patch. The whole thing with the fighting where mm -hmm. he, you know, where he didn't join in when during the altercation. I think it was against Phoenix. Right, right. And he took some slack for that. But overall, listen, he's handled himself. His composure's been really good. And he's handled himself really well, despite the fact that his father just keeps kind of putting his foot in his mouth and just making things worse and making it even more of a distraction. One more time, if you want to give us a shout, call us 516-945-9099. We are the Polar Opposites. He's Matt. I'm Craig. Matty, let's bring the show home with a little Polar by Polar. Polar by Polar wraps up our show. We have 10 topics. It's fairly simple. Polar is yes, you agree. Bipolar is you disagree. And Matty is guaranteed to get this mixed up at least at some point during the show. Maddie, are you ready? Ho! All right, Maddie, number one, polar or bipolar? Ezekiel Elliott made the right decision to just serve the suspension instead of going through more appeals. Uh, it's bipolar because you were going to serve the suspension anyway. You were going to serve it anyway. It doesn't matter, but you could have served it the first six games instead of the last six games, and now you've screwed your team even more than before. So, no, it was stupid. You should have honestly just said, you know what? I'm not guilty, but I'm not going to win here. You're not going to win. You sign the collective bargaining agreement that says he can do whatever he wants. That's what you did, and so you, now you just got to give up, and you screwed your team because you could have maybe won that game the other day, and now you didn't because uh, you had to go and be a tough guy and try to pull the Tom Brady thing, which never works out because the NFL always wins. Number two, despite the horrible outcome, the Bills made the right decision by benching Tyrod Taylor for Nathan Peterman. This is bipolar for me. Um, basically, listen, we already know what Tyrod Taylor is, right? He's not. He's a marginally good quarterback. And he's not going to lead you to the playoffs. He's probably not, he's definitely not going to lead you to the Super Bowl. But you pulled him for Nathan Peterman. I don't really understand why they pulled Tyrod. I know he had a bad game against the Saints. And he's been shaky for most of the year anyway. But again, this is what we expected, right? I mean, he wasn't really that good to begin with. And then Peterman throws five picks in the game. And then you pull him in the second half. So now you've completely squashed this kid's confidence for the season. Because you're not going to put him back in, right? I mean, you're not going to Tyrod Taylor. Because the thing was, the Bills were in the run for a playoff spot. You know, even if it was going to be a 6 seed or a 5, they were in there. But now these moves that McDermott is making are very questionable. And I think it's kind of messed up the team a little bit. And the schedule only gets worse. Now you're going to face an angry Chiefs team in Arrowhead next week. And the kiss goes on and on. You still got to play the Patriots. I think they still have to play the Dolphins. So this is just going to be, you know, it was a bad decision. They should have known better. They should have just stuck with Tyrod. And then next year, if you want to go to Peterman, that's fine. Maddie, number three, polar or bipolar, all daily fantasy sports games are still rigged despite the new regulations. Well, rigged, they're rigged if you know how to work the system because they still haven't put a cap on the amount of teams you can have. That cap should be five. So if you're in one of those uh, the, the fan duel ones, it's like a dollar where 80,000 people sign up. 
or whatever it is, like there's a, you know, whatever, and the top wins 9,000 and so on down the line, and you can have 500 teams, and you spend 500 hours to win 9,000, that's what you're gonna do. That's how it's rigged. If you could only say have five teams per tournament, then you know what, it wouldn't be rigged, because then you'd actually, it would actually have to be work. It's not See, work right now, it's computer crap. One thing for me is like, and I still do Fandle, because I actually like doing Fandle, but at the same time, I always, the first place team always has that one receiver that nobody would draft. No. And the guy has like a thousand, like 200 yards receiving. Yes. And that's when I know it's a FanDuel employee that's probably jumping in and like rigging the system. Oh, probably. Uh, <laughs> number four, the ridiculous amount of shows dedicated to it have taken the fun out of fantasy football. This is polar for me. Um, fantasy football used to be fun because you just draft the team and then you just play the card you dealt, right? But now it's like all these statistics and it's like these weird statistics too. It's like, yeah, this, this defense has given up double digit points to tight ends in the month of November when the temperature's under 40 degrees. It just kills it. it like it, there's no fun in it anymore because again, it's just like you're you just want to draft the team, see how they do. If you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. But they make it to the point where you're doing you're you're spending countless hours whether it's on the NFL network, CBS Sports network, ESPN, whatever it is. And it just takes the fun out of it. And it's just like it's just it's I don't know. I mean, what it's fairly simple. You want to start this guy or not? If you want to start him, start him. But don't rely on these guys. And the funny thing is, the guys who host these shows are the most conceited people I've ever met. Oh, I've been saying for the way years they sit Matthew there. Money. Yeah, the way they sit there with Matthew Barry or Jamie Eisenberg for CBS Sports Network, they act like they are like the gurus of fantasy, and they're never right. No. That makes it even no, worse. No, no, no. Number five, Matty Polar or Bipolar. You're finally seeing the positives of the Sixers tanking strategy from a few years ago. I mean, I guess polar. They're nine I guess. and seven. Right, but nine and seven. If they, if they, if, when I see it, when which they're, makes them when the, they're the, the three in the East. But when right? they're the, but when when they're the Boston Celtics, when they go on a sixteen-game run, when they do something special, when they make the playoffs, when they do something good, when they make it to the finals, then I will believe that to happen. The problem I have right now is I still have not seen a full season of Joel Embiid. As good as he's been, as as good as as uh, 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 you know, the, the ben, point Simmons. Guard, ben Simmons has been. Um, I, I still need to see them both for a whole season because we haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen it, how the rigors of the NFL and uh. NBA seasons are going to take. And if you watch the flop by Joel Embiid last night, he's or the other night, you know he's got an acting career in his future. And Pretty not to brutal. mention Markel Fultz hurt. Yeah, with, like every every guy you don't get drafted by the 76ers, you're going to miss the first year. It's always going to happen. Craig, number six, the Mets have a legitimate chance at landing Japanese star Shohei Otani. Oh, God, give me a break. It's bipolar. But the thing is, is that first of all, like we said before, he's going to two teams, either the Yankees or the Dodgers, most likely the Yankees. The thing about the Mets is, is like, number one, we don't know how serious they are interested in, even though they say they're talking to him or whatever. But again, are they really going to pony up the money eventually? I mean, yeah, they have the money now to buy him. Right. And the thing is, even if he was with the Mets, I mean, he could he'll still get the same type of advertising and publicity and all those, you know, endorsements that he would with the Yankees. But the Yankees are the team with the better history, the richer history, and he's going to want to go there regardless. The thing at this point though is is that the Mets are the tease of Major League Baseball with their fans. They always claim they're going after these guys, and they never do. And then it just, and then they're right back to where they started. This is why I don't want to see a bunch of guys on one-year deals. I want to see guys that they're going to build around for like three or four years. And right now, I'm not seeing it. Otani's not coming to the Mets. It'll be a huge, huge upset if he did. Maddie, number seven, polar or bipolar. It seems odd that adult film star Ron Jeremy is being accused of sexual assault. Um, bipolar. Just because you're in porn doesn't mean you can't sexually assault somebody. It also doesn't mean that that people don't want to be touched. There are times when people want to be touched and people don't want to be touched. And if everybody would just follow my rule, it's a real simple rule. Don't touch anybody who doesn't want to be touched. And if they tell you don't want to be touched, stop. And if you start touching them because they're okay with it, and then later on say they don't want to be touched, stop there too. And you won't have these problems. Ron Jeremy, you're in porn. You got, you got to touch women for your job. Why are you touching them outside of work when they don't want to be touched? Man. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Man, he is ugly. <sighs> <laughs> Number eight, there may be hope, maybe hope yet for Rutgers football. I'm going to say polar. Um, I know it sounds like kind of strange. I mean, they play in the Big 12, and the thing is they have to play Ohio State, Michigan State, Michigan. They play a lot of tough teams, but I've seen some good things. I actually watched a little bit of Rutgers football this year. I like what I see. They've won some big games. They beat uh, Purdue. They beat, they 
came pretty close to beating Nebraska. I thought they played Nebraska pretty well. They also beat Maryland, and they also played pretty well against Michigan. The only really blowouts they had, I mean, they got blown up by Indiana last week and then Ohio State, so there's still a lot to be done. But I like what Chris Ash is doing second year, because last year they were, like, embarrassing to NCAA football in general. This year it looks like, you know, you, you know the guys are developing a little bit better, and they just matched, they just landed a pretty top QB prospect, high school kid, from New Jersey, blew off Miami, which is probably the better school to go to in the ACC, sure, sure. to go to Rutgers. So you're kind of seeing, you know, the seeds being planted. They got a long way to go, and, and the thing is also what kind of sucks for them is as long as they're in the Big 12 and they're playing these teams, they're not going to go anywhere because the talent in some of those other teams is just 10 times better. I agree. Maddie, number nine, polar or bipolar, the only Thursday that NFL football should be played on is Thanksgiving. Polar. It's real simple. Stop. Just stop playing the Thursday night games. They're usually bad. They're usually unprepared. The Redskins this week don't have enough players to really practice <laughs> because there's have so many injuries and you're going to make them go into a game unprepared to play football, which could be mean more injuries for them and for other people on the field. So why don't we just stop? Let's the, the only one should be Thursday. Have it always be the Cowboys and Lions and you rotate other people and it's just one inconvenience for one year, but at least those teams get to be home. And or or if you're going to keep Thursday night, then you have to have two buys and there's a buy before the Thursday game and then another buy mix, mixed in. So you never plan on a short week. But I don't know how you do that. But yes, it, is, it should be one thing. It is tough. Stupid. It is tough getting ready for NFL football. Oh, it's ridiculous. It's the short week and just the, the level of plays. Been it's been terrible. Bad. Craig, number 10, no matter how old you are, you always look forward to the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Yes, I'm going to stay polar because I actually enjoy it, especially now with two kids. They enjoy it, too. Look. It's a fun time. Thanksgiving's a great holiday, you know, getting together with family and all that stuff. I'm going to be heading to Maryland to see my family on Thursday for the weekend. The parade is always like kind of the starting point before you get into football. When you get into the Lions and then you get into the Cowboys before the Sunday night game and everything. The Thursday night game you really should get rid of. But yeah, I enjoy it. I know a lot of other people do. Your facial reaction tells me enough that you don't I live really... in Midtown Manhattan. I don't enjoy any parades. Listen, it's I just a work, collection of stupid people. I work right by Herald Square, so you can imagine the traffic cool. around my area in the morning. But you know what? Regardless, it's always a fun time of the year. It's always a fun tradition. Yes, I always look forward to it no matter how old I am. So yeah, that's pretty much it. And with that, Polar or Bipolar is officially over. And this episode of Polar Opposites is over, and we'd like to thank Strong Island TV for having us on once thank again. You. We will be back on Strong Island TV Tuesday night, December 5th, yes. 9 Eastern time. So check us out. We are available on our regular podcast, polaropposites.podbean.com, iTunes, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, and follow us on the Twitter at Polar Opposites one Everyone have a very happy Thanksgiving. Maddie, what are you doing on Thanksgiving? Uh, I'm going to go out to my folks, have some eats, have some drinks, be safe. Don't drive drunk. If you've had too much to drink, wait where you are. Wait to drive. Don't drive high. Don't drive drunk. Just drive normal. And don't drive too early after turkey because you'll fall asleep because of trip to fan. Everybody have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and we will see you again on Tuesday, December 5th, 9 o'clock Eastern time, right here on Strong Island TV. Bye.